live on a volcanic planet. There are volcanoes all over the Earth, from northern Russia to Antarctica. They are found on every continent. They are the wildest forms of nature, untamable, dangerous, and dramatic. They are still being found. The largest volcano in the world was discovered in 2013, a massive undersea mountain off the coast of Japan. It's not the largest we know of. That would be Mons Olympus on Mars. Nor is it the largest ever on Earth. That was likely an Indonesian volcano that 70,000 years ago almost wiped out mankind, leaving less than 1,000 breeding pairs of humans to continue our race. The biggest is yet to come. The Yellowstone supervolcano erupts every 600,000 years. The last eruption was 648,000 years ago, so it's now long overdue. When it erupts, it will likely be the largest natural explosion in the history of the Earth, equivalent to about a thousand nuclear bombs, or a one-kilometer asteroid hitting the Earth. It will drop world temperatures by 10 to 20 degrees, and will eventually likely trigger the end of civilization. There's thankfully no active volcano today comparable with Yellowstone. But the one that perhaps comes closest is Niragongo, deep in Central Africa, considered the most dangerous volcano in the world. Its last major eruption, a few years ago, killed many people, ran a river of lava right through the city of Goma, and made refugees out of over 120,000 people. We went to climb this large towering volcano to see the power of it and the risk it presents to the people and wildlife of the Congo. It's a long way to get there, flying first to London, England, then to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, then to Kigali, Rwanda, then by land across Rwanda, crossing the border into the Congo. The sprawling rough scrabble town of Goma is our last stop before base camp. To put it mildly, Goma is not Geneva. How poor is the eastern Congo? In Goma, they make their own bicycles out of wood. And when I start handing out Congolese francs to my photographic subjects, it almost causes a riot. That's me in green, besieged by this mob of urchins. Above the crazy street scenes of Goma lurks smoking Niragongo volcano. In 2002, it had a major eruption that sent a river of lava right through the city of Goma. The disaster brought more hardship to a city that has suffered war and poverty for decades. We met with Jacques Derrieux, a French scientist who's been studying the volcano for 30 years. During the last eruption in 2002, we have been extremely lucky because the lava flows so that the tent of the city were moving at a speed between five and eight kilometers per hour, allowing the people to, to run away. If we do have in the city, lava flows at a speed between, I don't know, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, it will be a huge catastrophe. Uh, that eruption just occurred after 11 years of war. And the volcano was more impressive to the people than the 11 years of war. In 2002, the lava flowed so fast that cars and trucks were engulfed before they could be moved. And they're still there today, a permanent reminder of the power and unpredictability of an active volcano. See the boy peeking out from the back of that rusted truck? Hard to believe it, but that's his home now. If Niragongo blows its stack again, who knows what will happen to this shanty town and the people who live in it. We prepared to climb to see the state of the volcano today. So we're here now, and I'm told we will go up to the coulee, <laughs> and then up to the fracture. And so we began the six-hour trek, straight up the steep volcano. Our Congolese porters were incredible. This is a challenging climb. And these guys do it carrying everything from heavy cans of water, to tents, to my camera, to an AK-47 to protect us with, and do it with speed. Some of them also have pretty amazing stories to tell about their experiences with the volcano. There were three men who died in this eruption. 
il y avait beaucoup de maisons qui ont été cassées et blirées beaucoup avec des plantes, des haricots, des patates douces, des pommes de terre, des choux, yeah. des bananes. Tout s'était brûlé. Wow. I thought it would be interesting to try and get down inside the volcano. Not interesting enough for me personally, you understand, but perhaps interesting enough for one of the geologists traveling with us. It's free. Okay. Pull and it locks. All right. Squeeze and it's free. I'll place the roof pad. Good. What's it like? But eventually he too decided discretion was the better part of valor. It uh, gets uh, pretty tough to take after a while. Not worth going any deeper. Not without an air-conditioned suit. There are lots of holes leading deep into the lava. When the lava flowed through here in 2002, this was actually a rainforest. And you see a lot of these casts from the trees that used to be here. The lava flowed around the trees and then burned the trunks out. So you've got these holes all the way up the path to the summit. Our team continues to trudge up the hill. By the end of the day, we're staggering up the 40 degree slope. I can't wait to get to the top of this thing. I know that climbing beside him with my heavy camera, I feel just the same. Come on up, have a look. We finally make it, joining our compatriots. This is it. Song. Oh, this is great. You're impressed. Oh, man. That is awesome. Congratulations, guys, you made it. Congratulations. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Welcome to the top. After five years of planning, five days of traveling, and five hours of climbing, completely socked in by thick clouds and then wicked thunderstorms that lasted for three days. When it finally cleared, we got a chance to get out and witness and photograph the world's largest lava lake. Now we wait for darkness to witness one of the rarest and most spectacular sights on the planet, Mount Narragansett. It's a window into the core of the earth, 2,000 degrees of molten fury. It's an amazing sight and a reassuring one. The boiling cauldron of lava actually means the volcano is comfortably venting off its energy. For now, it seems the 600,000 people of Goma are safe. But who knows what tomorrow will bring to this corner of darkest and hottest Africa. Not all volcanoes are found in places as wild as the eastern Congo. Costa Rica, for instance, is a peaceful tropical paradise with lush rainforests, great waterfalls, and all kinds of opportunities to see and photograph nature in the raw. It's also an adventure playground with thick rainforest, wild rivers, untouched jungles, and especially an array of active volcanoes running from north to south. Costa Rica is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, a 40,000 kilometer band of seismic activity that has created hundreds of volcanoes, many of them clustered in this small country. Over the last century, Many spectacular eruptions have made Costa Rica a hotbed of volcanic activity. Being in this ring of fire also makes the country prone to earthquakes. The 
2009 quake was dramatically captured in the middle of local live news coverage. Although Arazu has erupted 23 times in modern history, the show it gave to U.S. President John Kennedy is considered most infamous. Lasting over two years, the volcano dumped a huge amount of ash over central Costa Rica, even covering the runway that Air Force One had to land on. The built-up ash and heavy rains combined to produce flash floods that caused tremendous damage. Irazu is now a national park thousands of visitors coming each year to see the volcano that did so much damage to their country. Although inactive at the moment, Irazu is developing fissures that indicate it could blow its top any time. The real action though is Mount Arenal, Costa Rica's most active volcano, with a well-populated town right below it. Scientists are trying to predict what the big hill might do, and we got a chance to climb up it and look at it with them. The first half of the climb was the easy part. From here we walk. The international team of geophysicists from Ireland, Italy and Costa Rica are installing seismic imaging equipment that will help them understand and more importantly predict the underground magma movement on the volcano. Uh, we're just uh, taking up the cables for connecting the instrument. The seismometer needs to be connected to a computer and to a global positioning system for the time signal. So we're just gathering together all those cables so we can bring them up into the field with the seismometers and connect everything up. One, two. Climbing volcanoes, especially with scientific or camera equipment on your back, is usually a hot, strenuous task, and aerial is no exception. There's no real trail, just a steep field of rocks and lava bombs from past eruptions. I already hear rocks coming down the side of the mountain. The area we are exploring today is well within striking distance of Arenal's molten hot lava and paraclastic flow, like this one that killed two visitors here in 2000. All right, we've arrived at the site. Once at the high optimum measurement site, the scientists and technicians some assistance from my climbing partner, George Karunas, lay out the piles of cable and wire, precisely measuring the field and installing and calibrating the instruments. Chris Bean, the leader of the expedition, fills me in on what it's all about. What we're doing is we are trying to understand the nature of the seismic sources on the volcano. All volcanoes make, make noise and uh, as seismologists, we put out instruments on the surface of the volcano to record those sounds that the volcano makes, much like a medical cardiograph, except we're looking at acoustic signals rather than electrical signals. And so what we're doing is putting out these instruments to try to understand what those signals are telling us about how fluids are moving in the subsurface in a volcano. Underneath Arenal, and every volcano, is a labyrinth of underground chambers where 1,200 degree magma flows. How level it is? Yes. These tests help them understand where the magma is moving and where and when it might erupt. We're putting out 10 instruments in what's called an array, so they're just out in a, in a semicircle, and we are installing those individual seismometers, and each seismometer records ground vibration, so they're continuous, even though we can't feel it here because we, we're not so sensitive to ground vi vibration, they're continuous vibrations as we stand here. These instruments are sensitive enough to detect those, and we can use some techniques to turn that information into a knowledge of what the near surface uh, variability or structure of the volcano is, so that's today's job. But Arenal's a serious piece of work. And even seasoned volcanologists get nervous working on this mountain. Well, I do. we're only going to stay here for as short a time as possible, I'm going to put it that way. <laughs> you don't like to linger here? I wouldn't, I wouldn't linger. I'd say I wouldn't camp overnight uh, at this particular location. I wouldn't linger. Um, 
I mean, it's nice to be here. It puts an edge on, on it, but, uh, you know, it, it can be dangerous as well. So we'll get in and out as quickly as we can. On the other side of the world, the other side of the ring of fire, lies Indonesia, with more than 150 sites, one of the most volcanic places on the planet. Indonesia is full of history, color, fire, and mysterious creatures. The island archipelago is also home to many of the world's great volcanoes. We managed to get close to many of them. Papandayam, Bromo, Samaru, and the mother of all volcanoes, Krakatoa. On August 27th, 1883, Krakatoa erupted with a force never seen before. Hundreds of villages were wiped out by the explosion and huge pyroclastic flows. Even more devastating, Krakatoa produced a 40 meter high tsunami that claimed 36,000 lives. So powerful, it sent ships three kilometers inland in the massive surge. We're heading for the island of Rakata, once part of Krakatoa, now a smaller island where we should be able to get a good view of the very active remaining volcano, now known as Anak Krakatoa. Guiding us is Indonesian volcanologist Donny Wijianto. How's it going, Donny? I'm fine, thank you. Where are we off to today? Today we're gonna go to uh, Krakata, the original Krakatoa and camp there. Excellent. Super bloody maximum bagus, f***ing awesome dude. <laughs> <laughs> right. Donny may not be your stereotypical scientist, but he knows volcanoes, and he starts by taking us to the Krakatoa Observatory to show us the latest seismic activities on the islands. We arrive at the exploding island, just as it is sending a huge ash cloud hundreds of meters in the air. We set up a camp that gives us a front row seat on what was once the most destructive volcano in human history. Our crew begins preparing dinner, setting up tents, and complaining this about year, the weather. Super bloody maximum hot. It is hot, isn't it? Yeah. Not quite as hot as over there on the other island. Yeah, because it's windy on the island. Windy? Yeah. Oh yeah, there's also um, hot rocks flying out of it. What a sight for a swim. Late in the afternoon, we get on to Anak Krakatoa and try to get close to the top of the cone. This is going to be tough determining how close is safe on this one. I like this mountain. Well, it's starting to get late in the day. The sun's going to be going down soon enough, so it's best to just get off the mountain go and observe from a safer area because when it starts getting dark and these things start heading for you, <laughs> game over, man. Krakatoa slowly rebuilding itself with these new eruptions is a fascinating volcano, but not by any means the only one in Indonesia. Next, Donny leads us to Papandayan volcano on Western Java. So the flow came down from the crater here. Yeah. And then extended how far down? Telling us of the major 2002. Four and a half kilometer down. Really? Yeah. And then some of the rock, they're flying to the other side in uh, Pangalengan. That's right over the other side of the mountain? Right on the side of the mountain. He also tells me about his fascination with volcanoes. Volcano is amazing. You know, you never know what's going to happen. As a mother nature, it's a big power. I like to learn about it. So up here you said that there's a uh, fumarole that sounds like a jet engine. How far yeah. away is that? About 500 meters from here. <laughs> I 
Oh, and this is steep here, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's not just steep. Super bloody maximum steep. F***ing <laughs> deep. <laughs> you see, Donnie learned most of his English from Eddie Murphy movies. As well as bad language, there are also bad, bad smells coming from the sulfuric vents of Papandayan. Wow. Sulfur is hot and liquefied. And the gases are not something any of us want to get into our lungs. Let's go take a look. Yeah. But that's so amazing. There's so much liquid sulfur in that one spot. It's just yeah. bubbling away. Inside these vents is a pond of liquid sulfur. And in its liquid form, it's orange. And when it comes up through the gas, it crystallizes and forms these yellow deposits that you see everywhere here. But the gas is so <coughs> toxic. So toxic that it's not a good idea to try to talk. At the other end of Java is another volcano that has been turned into a real hell on Earth. Kawa Ijin is also rich in sulfur deposits that are in this case dug out of the ground by hand and lugged over the mountain by miners working for pittance. It is back-breaking work done by men with only basic tools, no safety equipment, and no protection. Once they have dug the sulfur from the volcano, they lug loads, some up to 100 kilograms, out of the crater. The journey continues with a back-breaking hike to the peak, then down the other side to the way station. Each miner makes this grueling trip twice a day. Back in the mine, I convinced George to try out the load himself for the camera. Like that? Okay? Yeah, okay. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. Yes, it's as heavy as it looks. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Strong. Super strong. These guys are supermen. I don't know how they do it. And then, it's not just a matter of walking 10 feet. Oh, no. They have to go all the way up there to the top of the crater. Four kilometers. And it's not flat. It is steep, rugged, volcanic terrain. Wow. Now that we've seen the strength of the Indonesians, we hire another 20 of them to help us get to the top of one of Java's highest, most active, and most dangerous volcanoes, Mount Simmer. Looks pretty far. It's a long two-day hike that starts pretty flat and increasingly becomes steeper and steeper. As we hike through the jungle, we can occasionally catch glimpses of the volcano looming in front of us. It's a long, hot, tough climb just to get to the base of the remote volcano. But the reality of volcano exploration is, if you want to see the good eruptions, you've got to work for it. I don't know how these guys do this every day. <laughs> you know, when I'm sitting at home, I love talking about climbing mountains. But when you're halfway up the side of one, it's amazing how the opinions change. This is one intimidating volcano. The idea today is to get to the base of the cone, and then when you look and you see the cone and realize that's what I have to climb tomorrow. 
There are a number of things that make Semeru a particularly difficult volcano to climb. First of all, quite simply, it's very steep. And this is the easy part. It gets much harder from here. You have to be off the mountain by 10 a.m. So you have to start the summit push at midnight and climb in the dark. It is very high, which means two things. You've got a long way to climb, and the higher you climb, the more out of breath you get. There's a knife edge ridge you have to cross before you get to the main part of the mountain. And when you do get there, you find it's covered in loose scree, so your boots are full of stones, and for every two steps you take forward, you'll slide one step back. Incredibly steep. Of course, on top of all that, there's the other little matter that the mountain is continually exploding. Almost to the top. Hopefully really soon. Samero is the highest point on all of Java. It's over 3,670 meters high. And pretty soon, I'm gonna be on the top of it. Hopefully, if I don't die between now and then. At 5.30, the sun makes its first there appearance. In the thin air, the sunrise provides a good excuse to stop climbing, try and catch one's breath, and admire the view. Wow, beautiful. Better keep going. Oh, the glorious last few steps. Ha-ha! <laughs> Summit! I'm never going to do it again. The same as I said last <laughs> Never time. do it again. Funny, never I was again. saying the same thing to myself. Ignoring the danger signs, we head for the action. And we get it. Maybe a bit too close, so we retreat a little to wait for a big eruption. And Semeru doesn't disappoint. Oh, there we go. Oh, big one. Look at that. Wow. Ah, billowing up huge dark clouds of ash. Oh, and rocks, look at the impacts. Wow. <laughs> now that was worth the trek up here. Perfect conditions, blue sky, very active mountain. You've seen a lot of my climbing partner, George Karunas, here. And you might start to think that I'm almost married to him. I'm not. You're not. Michelle Schubert is. And that's because I Michelle? helped convince him to ask her to marry me. Yes. Oh my god. On the lip, naturally, of an exploding volcano. I organized the volcanic wedding to take place in Vanuatu, an island paradise in the South Pacific, with the very impressive Yasser volcano on one of the out islands. Real nice. Big ash cloud. Yasser Volcano, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. So we set out to explore it, and the two of us set out ropes so that I can film George descending toward the crater. This is uh, a bit treacherous. We drive stakes into the ground for the safety lines, and George asks me to drag his limp body back in case he should be knocked out cold by a flying lava bomb. As long as I'm squeezing it, I can go down. As soon as I let go, I'm attached to it, and pull me up on the rope. I film George's last minute dressing into a full fireproof suit. So far, so good. I'm about 50 meters inside the volcano now. The lava's really starting to glow bright orange. 
It's starting to get dark. Whoa. Big explosions behind me. Huge. Gotta keep going. Okay, I'm 60 meters down into the volcano, and this is as far as I can go safely because I'm at the end of my rope. As a safety precaution, I don't want to go any further. The rocks around me are smoking, and uh, I'm totally surrounded by relatively fresh lava bombs. This is crazy. <coughs> Okay, I'm getting blasted with sulfur dioxide now. I'm gonna put my mask on. Oh, big eruption. Noisy eruption. This is not a place that's conducive to life for very long. I can't stay here long. From my vantage point, I can see the eruptions begin to increase in size. So I urge George to ascend. At that point, though, George spies a huge bomb that has landed behind him and determines to get it. From high above, George's bride-to-be, operating a fifth camera, observes the crazy action. On the walkie-talkie, I call to George, half egging him on, half calling him back. Fortunately, George hears more of the enthusiasm than the warning in my voice and gets to a brand new level. However, just as he starts to return, there's another major eruption. Only when reviewing the footage later do we see how close the lava bombs were falling. It's hot. Brand new bomb from Yasser. I saw where it hit. Ran out to get it. Ugh. Woo! Whoa. Look at that. Still glowing. I feel the heat coming off of this. But spying his fiancée watching from the top of the hill, George remembers why he came to Vanuatu. All right, here I come. I think I've pushed my luck enough today. Hot. All right. Enough messing around. It's time to get married. The night before the wedding, we celebrate with members of the John Frum Group, the strange cargo cult that worships a mythical U.S. Marine they believe will be their messiah. The next day... coming all the way from Vanuatu to, uh, to get married. So I'd just like to welcome you and say thank you for coming this far. As Pastor Isaac leads them through the ceremony, you have the volcano gives the some spectacular eruptions. In the presence of the Almighty God, that you promise to take this woman as your wife. I promise to take this woman to care and to support her, to care and to support her, in good times and in bad times, and 
so happy of the many years that we've had. And I look forward to many, many more sharing our lives together. You may now slip the ring into the bride's finger. You have been my supporter, my wall, my rock. And if we're not careful, <laughs> we might melt into one. I have this great honor to pronounce you husband and wife. And you may now kiss your bride. Let's ask the band to give a little song to finish off this ceremony. career as a cinematographer, it's the first wedding I've filmed, and a very memorable one. But for the moment, I've lost my climbing partner, with George and his new bride off on a honeymoon, shark diving in the Bahamas. I decide to head to Guatemala, one of the most volcanically active countries in the Americas, to see the volcanoes there. This time, I have a new group of climbing companions. Thirteen young'uns, all of them under the age of 27. Guatemalan volcano exploration is unique in that it can all be done from one central place, the classic and colorful colonial city of Antigua. Antigua was the capital of Guatemala in the colonial era, but was twice destroyed by earthquakes. It has been restored today into one of the most pleasant towns in Central America, though it is still threatened by underground action. Look down any of Antigua's streets on a clear day, and you'll see one of the four active volcanoes that surround it. Naturally, it is home base for the country's best volcano guides. We decide to climb with Ox Tours, who assign us their top guide, Mahudi Van Haddam. Well, it's just a long run. It's just, it's just because getting here, I, I, I want to get to this campsite with enough time to set camp and have, and then get us up there before sunset. On this expedition, I'm trying out a new tool, a drone helicopter camera that I hope to fly into the craters of the volcanoes. Everyone warns me of the possible problems I may have there, but no one guesses the real reason why the drone won't work on the big mountains. We start with a climb up Pacaya. An active but modestly sized volcano one can manage in a day. But while the volcano is smoking, the clouds and mist swirling around the peaks make the job of filming it a challenge. However, we do get the drone in the air and out into the first of Pacaya's craters, where it shoots some video. I safely get it back. We then take on the high and challenging Mount Ecatenengo, sister peak to smoking Mount Fuego. 
It's another long, tough climb, helped until the steepest sections by pack horses carrying our gear. This is a bit of a killer climb. We've been climbing since uh, about nine o'clock this morning. It's now two or so, and we've been climbing, climbing all this time. The end is in sight. We got people spread all over the last quarter of the mountain here. There's a girl behind that's not feeling well, and hope she doesn't drag the back end down. We got about three people ahead of us, and we're here. Not too far to go. Back there we got Mount Agua, a beautiful looking stratovolcano. It's uh, apparently dangerous to climb for banditry in the lake, so it isn't often climbed, but it is a perfect looking volcano. It looks as nice as Mount Fuji in Japan, doesn't it? It's uh, a really perfect volcano. Looks like it's got a, some kind of a TV tower or something on the top of it. And uh, where are we above it? Well, we're about level with it now. I think when we get to the top here, we'll be above it because this is one of the highest volcanoes in Central America that we're climbing today. As it gets higher, it gets steeper. My daughter Brianna, handling second camera, is one of the first to the top. 20 minutes later, I join her at the peak. We're here. On the top. Oh, this is it. This is the summit. Great. And I can see smoke coming off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fuego over there. So it was time to set up the drone camera and send it over into the crater. But it wasn't to be. Well, this is a total bummer. The whole plan was to come here with the drone and get some shots into the crater. Seems the air is too thin up here doesn't have enough strength, the battery power doesn't work fine lower down, work fine on the Kaya, but up here in this thin air, it just doesn't have the oomph to get it up in the air and control it, so we can't get any height out of it. What a pity. And so we have to be satisfied with filming the volcano in the conventional manner. Not so bad, as the sun sets behind us, we have a great vantage point of it. The explosions induce great enthusiasm for my youthful climbing companions. As the evening clouds roll in and the sun sets, we prepare for a cold, colorful, and noisy night beside exploding Mount Fuego. famous volcano in history, Mount Vesuvius in southern Italy, exploded on April 24th, 79 AD, completely covering the major city of Pompeii with ash and lava. For two days and nights the volcano laid ruin to the city and killed almost every inhabitant. After the eruption, Pompeii was lost and forgotten for more than 1500 years. The light ash of the pyroclastic flow of the volcano had the effect of perfectly preserving Pompeii, completely covering it so that once it was dug up starting in the 1740s, an amazing window into the Roman Empire was created. The archaeologists of the 18th century not only uncovered the architecture, sculpture, art, and housewares of the Roman era, 
created at the height of the Empire's power. But they were also able to carefully create casts of the bodies of dozens of Roman citizens caught in their moment of death at the hands of the volcano. They also uncovered a Pompeii brothel, complete with stone beds and frescoes well protected by the ash, illustrating the variety of offered services. For those of us who like to explore active volcanoes, it is sobering to see how these dangerous forces of nature can wipe out the lives and industry of people in an instant. And while Pompeii is gone, Vesuvius is still here. It had a major eruption in 1944, at the height of World War II, and it now threatens not just the roads and villages surrounding it, but the major city of Naples now expanding to the flanks of the volcano. But Naples is not the only city in Italy threatened by volcanoes, so we head further south to the biggest volcano in continental Europe, Mount Etna. We meet with one of the world's leading experts on the volcano, Professor Carmelo Ferlito. It is. Actually, Etna is uh, known for being an effusive volcano, so for giving rise uh, to mostly effusive eruptions, meaning eruptions with lava flow. Ferlito shows us some of the images shot of Etna in its many recent eruptions. Here, this, this slow, there's a pit crater. There are people here. One of the most active volcanoes in the world, Etna is in a state of almost constant activity, known for large lava flows and major damaging eruptions. When it blows its top, it destroys everything in its way. With dozens of major eruptions over the last century, it poses a serious threat to nearby ski resorts, people and towns. headed out to see the volcano, but at this time of year, Etna is not really interested in greeting visitors. Who knew we could expect such conditions at the southern tip of Italy? Certainly not our car rental company that gave us an underpowered car with no snow tires. Let's go. While I drive, George shouts instructions and then pushes. Yeah, go, 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 go. But the steep, slush-covered volcano is too much for the little car, so we have to abandon the climb. It's not about getting to the top anymore, it's about getting back down. Damn you, Etna! Damn you! It is disappointing for us, but we have a very promising alternative to tackle. Mount Stromboli rises a thousand meters out of the Tyrrhenian Sea off the coast of Sicily. Beneath Stromboli, a village of 700 people goes about its business, seemingly unfazed by the threat of living in the shadow of one of the world's most active volcanoes. Our guide, Zaza, drives us in his microbus. We navigate the incredibly narrow streets up to the base, the starting point for the thousand meter trek to the summit. The caution sign tells us to Beware, do not trespass this limit. Risk of landslide and volcanic eruption, which is pretty much what we came for. So, undaunted, we keep trekking up the hill. This is where the climb gets tough, with steep terrain and tricky footing. But Zaza and his trusty dog, Pele, know the way. This looks like the steep part. Like most volcanoes, Stromboli soon becomes a 30 to 40 degree climb. 
Eventually, we make it high above the ocean wow. at the summit. <laughs> As the sun sets over Stromboli, I begin to find camera positions for the evening light show. This is a good spot over here. E anche lì posso spiegare là. Zaza tells us of his passion for exploring this explosive volcano. Sì. Ai, così. Ai. Ehi là. 30 anni fa io sono salito la prima volta qua. Sì. Sono 30 anni, 78. Poi sono e ogni ogni volta che tu sali è diverso. La prima volta è la più bella. As darkness falls, I get set to film my climbing partner's take on this spectacular show. Well, tonight it looks like there's four different vents that are active on Stromboli. This one down here behind me is spitting out a lot of gas. It's glowing, but it's not really exploding. If we get really lucky, we'll get one of these vents shooting a huge plume of magma into the air. And right on cue, I get one. Oh, yeah. See? That's what I'm talking about. Woohoo! That is a big eruption. And that's why around the world, regular explosive eruptions are known as Strombolian eruptions. Because night after night, day after day, Mount Stromboli has been kicking them out for as long as mankind can remember. Unlike Italy, a rich, fertile land dotted with a few scattered volcanoes, Iceland is a vast, bleak landscape of volcanic rock, covered for much of the year in snow and, of course, ice. We drive far out into the Icelandic wilderness to see the volcanic bonanza, including its most distinctive feature, hot water vents, fumaroles, and geysers. This one, Gizer, gave the phenomenon its name. Following an earthquake in 2000, Gizer, although still boiling, has become a bit dormant. Nearby it, though, is Stroker, which erupts regularly. Of course, we had to get much closer to it than you were really supposed to be. There we go. I cannot recommend anyone getting this close to a geyser, because it's very, very dangerous. I've been watching it and timing it. I'll step back when it gets time to erupt. Just want to get in close for a couple pictures. Whoa! Warmed by the eruptions of boiling water, we head across the frozen landscape for a short sea passage across a rough stretch of the North Atlantic to take us to the offshore island of Jaime. There are a number of possible impediments to exploring volcanoes. Add seasickness to the list. We begin driving across the windswept tiny island. We're in the middle of the night on January 23rd, 1973. The earth exploded. At 2 a.m., completely without warning, the dormant Eldfell volcano violently erupted. A three kilometer fissure in the earth opened up and out poured red hot lava flowing at the speed of 199 cubic meters per second, threatening the people, buildings, and livestock of the island. Amazingly calm and well-organized, the people, led by emergency services, mobilized within minutes to mount the largest air-sea evacuation in Icelandic history. 5,000 people were transported off the island within hours. The flowing lava and tons of volcanic ash began burying the town. Once people were safely off the island, the major threat was to Jaime's most important feature, the harbor. The massive lava flows threatened to seal off the channel entrance. A plan was devised to stop the flow by cooling the lava with seawater. For months, millions of gallons of cold seawater were pumped onto the lava. At 
Eventually, the Icelanders stop the flow, and Jaime thrives today, 25% larger than before. As we head up to explore the top of the volcano, we run into the remnants of some Icelandic weather. Oh no. Okay, the car has sort of bottomed out. So we abandon the van for now and head up to the crater on foot. A crater that was only a short time ago an inferno. Not long ago, over a thousand degrees. Today it is covered with wind scoured ice and crusty snow. Uh, woo! Here's the crater of the volcano. This is the source of all the lava that flowed into town. It's so unbelievably windy right now. Today the big danger is getting blown off the mountain. And if George is having trouble standing upright, imagine the issues I'm having with the camera and tripod. It really is like hell on earth, another planet entirely. Let's go to Turkey now, where we find some rather ordinary looking volcanoes, all of them either extinct or dormant, that have created one of the world's most extraordinary landscapes. Massive volcanic eruptions 300 million years ago laid down a deep layer of weak volcanic tufa with an overlay of harder ash from a second series of eruptions. Years of erosion have created the wildly shaped hoodoos, known as fairy chimneys, seen today. Geothermal activity seldom has a positive result. The many Roman ruins throughout Turkey are a good example. Many are now wrecked by earthquake damage. Cappadocia is quite different. For here the remains of volcanic activity have been turned over hundreds of years into an extraordinary collection of dugout houses, churches, and even underground cities. The churches and monasteries are especially impressive, with most of the volcanic cave walls painted with frescoes. Many of these frescoes are still in excellent shape, others defaced by graffiti from the 19th century. The people of Cappadocia carved not just houses, barns, and churches, but also elaborate underground cities from the soft volcanic rock. This is the Ushkinek underground city. This is the uh, storage room, the second room in. They didn't really make them for people my size, especially not those tunnels. This is the first floor, and we're going down three or four more floors. So believe it or not, the people who lived in these caves and built these caves were so paranoid about strangers coming in to steal their wine or attack them, that they built in place these giant rock wheels to roll across in front of the entranceways so that they could protect themselves from strangers attacking them. One of the most iconic symbols of the area today are the whirling dervishes, a traditional cult-like dance movement that appears to mimic a cross between a human volcano and a human tornado. As always, the rich volcanic soils provide great opportunities for agriculture. Thank you. The grape pickers were willing to share their rich harvest bounty with me. But, like a lot of photographic subjects, eventually began to wonder how many shots I needed to take of them. <laughs> Undeterred, I head into town to film their sisters boiling down the grapes over a wood fire into jam. Today, people are finding all kinds of new opportunities to mine a living from the volcanic landscape. Omar Tusum turned a collection of ancient cave dwellings into the extraordinary museum hotel. This is the first concept, and then first luxury concept in the area. And the, the reason, because I restore the natural caves, 
which has been used for thousands of years and turned it a luxury accommodation here. Plus, we have a lovely pools and restaurants and that to this and great stuff. And then lovely clients. You may be in a cave in this hotel, but it is the most elegantly appointed cave in the world. With this hotel completed, Tusum is now exploring the potential for geothermal energy creation using the volcanically heated steam and water deep beneath Cappadocia. Nobody believe me, you know, this is a thermal area, but now I, to prove that last year I drilled nearly 900 meters and find it 180 degrees uh, water, hot water. The main thing is now, first of all, outside the national park area, we like to build uh, electric power stations. And do, because we have a work on Cappadocia, nearly 750 kilometers square, and through that, where we're going to put our uh, drilling and find the hot waters to have electric energy, greenhouses, and thermal hotels. This is going to be a, one of the best thermal spa hotels area in the world, probably. And then we're going to have lots of electric. Hot water geothermal energy is nascent, but the hot air balloon industry is booming. The volcanic flames and heat that created this wild landscape have been replaced by burning gas, also of course created deep inside the earth, that fuels the hundreds of hot air balloons now floating over Cappadocia. terrestrial volcanoes. Submersibles allow us to get down to witness them under the ocean. They have enabled scientists to make one of the most surprising discoveries in the history of oceanography, underwater hydrothermal volcanic vents. The Canadian underwater explorer and inventor Phil Newton remembers the extraordinary find made in 1977. The discovery of the heat vent is certainly well known to me. A couple of friends of mine were on board the vessel and the submarine that found the very first heat vent off the Galapagos. And uh, they were, <laughs> to say blown away is a complete understatement. Until then, no one knew there were volcanoes venting deep in the oceans. 
but the scientists made an even more amazing discovery. Colonies of life never before thought possible in such an extreme and hostile environment. Life without sun. Um, here we have life that is not based on sunlight. It's based not on photosynthesis, but on chemosynthesis, taking the, the uh, energy and the fuel directly from the heat vent. The remarkable discovery turned the science of marine biology upside down. The incredibly exciting thing about this environment, these animals are found in the black smoker environment, is how phenomenally hostile this environment is. It is a place that is hot and cold, hot like seven or eight hundred degrees, cold like close to freezing a few centimeters away. It's an environment that's toxic. Hydrogen sulfide is coming out under extreme pressure, and this is a gas that'll kill you dead if you breathe it. And what's intriguing is until this ecosystem was discovered only 30 years ago, uh, really this wasn't, a, you know, there was no understanding that animals could possibly live under such hostile conditions. Of course, what is truly exciting about this to scientists like Chris Harvey Clark is that it opens up much broader possibilities for life on other planets. Well, in the deep sea vents, Hydrogen sulfide is energy. And so we have a sort of upside down ecosystem. Up here we've got sun coming down. Down there we've got hydrogen sulfide and other energy rich compounds coming up out of the, the magma, really the mantle of the earth. It is of course extremely difficult and expensive to visit undersea volcanoes. But from time to time, volcanoes burst forth from the sea and create brand new islands. When I heard that a new one had been created in Tonga, I determined to see it. I traveled there through New Zealand, where we first checked out some more established Polynesian volcanoes. In order to get a better sense of what to expect on the brand new volcanic island in Tonga, we visited a small volcano off the coast of New Zealand called White Island. This rugged island is brimming with gas vents, fumaroles, and giant mud pools. White Island is one of the most active volcanic sites in New Zealand, and the energy is vented with astonishing power. This is one of the most intense fumaroles I've ever seen, and we wanted to get in closer to it. Our guide has a sense of how close one can get to it. Pretty much as far as we can really go. Oh, really? Can't get a little closer? He can, but um, you can go by yourself. <laughs> if it does, if it does, you can go. You can go in by yourself. <laughs> Meaning, I'm not going the hell up there. All right, well, I'll get. I'll go up to the end of the uh, the, the sulfurous rocks here. Yep. And just if that steam does turn, put on your gas mask because it's. Um... Oh, I'll put on my gas mask now, just in case. Yep. Taking each step very carefully. The terrain here at the White Island volcano gives clues as to what the new Tongan volcano may look like. The cracks in the ground give a sense of how unstable the land is. The power of the steam pouring out of the ground is enormous. I'd love to get a bit closer, but the ground all around the sumeral is all very soft and very unstable. And we soon discover how unstable. The crater wall just broke away. While we filmed the fumarole, there was a little seismic shift and a landslide of rocks fell down this cliff. Nothing like a volcanic rock slide to liven up your day. New Zealand is located in the volcanic ring of fire and there's evidence of geothermal activity everywhere. The hotbed for New Zealand volcanism is the area of Rotorua on the North Island, full of geysers, mud pools, and exploding fumaroles. They even cook their food here from the intense heat that flows from the earth. The most spectacular piece of New Zealand volcanism is the Piutu geyser. Piutu means explosion in Maori, and that's what it does about 20 times a day blasting boiling hot water over 35 meters into the air. 
From New Zealand, we fly north to Tonga to board the fishing boat that will take us out to the new island and try to figure out how we will actually get on to this somewhat forbidding piece of land. Well, see how the thing goes. They said that because it's in the open ocean, mm -hmm. boat can go there, but it's uh, sometime it just the swells. Yes. Let's go up. So we're gonna get a kayak up here as well. So or we do all sorts of thing, whatever. Any other way we can find, we we'll get ashore. Try to swim. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's an option. Yeah. Little did we know at that point that that is the option we'd be using. The big swells of the Pacific send my volcano chasing partner to his bunk while I film the crew bailing out the leaky old fishing boat. As a long, bumpy voyage drags on, George has even bigger problems. Ah, I just, just hit a big wave, and I rolled off the side, and my eye went right into the corner of this table. If it had been two centimeters lower, it would have gone right into my eye. Holy cow, the whole bench fell over. We administer some first aid with the island finally in sight. Are we trying to get uh, the edge of this one here and have a look at it? As we approach the island, yet another problem. The ship's boat has broken free and the crew must retrieve it. I Finally we get it back, get aboard, and with the usual difficulty get the motor started. We head for the new island, but as predicted, since we can't land in the surf, we have to swim to shore. George lands first and films me swimming in, using a stylish backstroke. Soon, like Robinson Crusoe, we're leaving new footprints on the freshly minted beach. The crusty lava bombs look like solid rock, but are easily broken into dust. In theory at least, it's probably one of the most unstable and dangerous places on Earth. It could easily begin to erupt again, and the still warm lava could just slide back into the sea. The air-filled pumice that created the New Islands is still very unstable. Any seismic event could smash it to pieces. The crusty lava bombs look like solid rock, but are easily broken into dust. We discover a crater filled with near boiling water that is the epicenter of the volcano. Despite all the problems and difficulties getting here, what a rush being on the newest land on Earth. Only four people had ever visited the island before George and I went on it. More people have been on the surface of the moon than had at that time visited Hunga Hapai. As a volcano to visit, I can't really recommend Hunga Hapai. It's almost as inaccessible as the spectacular, but famously difficult to see volcanoes of Kamchatka in eastern Russia. No, if you want spectacular volcanoes, fairly safe and easy to visit, the place to go is the big island of Hawaii. In fact, the two largest ones, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, you can drive to the top of. They're a long way up, so be prepared for the effects of high altitude. In fact, measured from its base at the bottom of the ocean, Mauna Kea is 33,000 feet high, much higher than Mount Everest. Both Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa are scientific observatories, picked for their high altitudes and clear air. Telescopes peer into the heavens, while an array of instruments monitor conditions here on Earth. Mauna Loa, 
the largest volcano on Earth, erupted most recently in 1984. Since the million-year-old Mauna Kea is dormant, the explosive dangers there are non-existent. However, there is considerable protest and controversy over the use of what are considered sacred volcano peaks for this secular purpose. When it is flowing, which it's been doing for the last 30 years, Kilauea is quite possibly the most spectacular volcano in the world. And you can see it by helicopter. We take to the air, hoping to get a unique perspective on some moving lava. One can really get a sense from up here of how massive and destructive this volcano is. Kilauea is a shield volcano. Rather than creating a cone like a more typical stratovolcano, the very viscous lava of Kilauea spreads over a wide area. The volcano destroyed a subdivision, many roads, and today flows through in rivers of lava and erupting lava fountains to the sea. But the only way to get close to Kilauea is by walking. It's a five-hour hike carrying your camera gear with you, and I assure you the tripod I was carrying was about 20 times heavier than that little one. You can see from the distant smoke plumes how far we still have to go. It is well worth the long walk when you get to the spot where the hot lava enters the Pacific, and even better, once darkness falls. Hawaii's Big Island is a fascinating struggle between the forces of volcanic creation battling the conflicting forces of marine erosion. Since you can get so close, it also offers the opportunity for volcano chasers to do some dumb and silly things. My boot caught on fire. It's unbearably hot here. This lava is 2,000 degrees. I'm getting dry roasted just standing next to it. And to take in one of the most magnificent sights of nature.